Because it provides end-to-end -end visibility, a DevOps platform offers us the opportunity to enlarge the DevOps tent and start to include roles that have traditionally existed in their own silos and been left out of the DevOps or even development lifecycle. One of the most logical roles to include is the role of the tech writer. Now, despite the fact that technical writers sit so close to the coding process and work so closely with developers, documentation has usually existed in a completely separate system. In our next talk and demo, Alec Clues is going to lay out specifically a detailed plan to involve tech writers in the process using documentation as code and ultimately outputting a GitLab Pages site. Let's check in and see how that works. Thank you, Cormac, and welcome, everyone. I live and work in Australia, and I would like to start with the customary acknowledgement of country. I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wundudjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respect to their elders, past and present. Why am I talking to you about docs as code? What are the problems we're solving here today? When projects grow, documentation is often managed by dedicated teams of technical writers to improve scalability and quality. They bring valuable skills, experience, and their own sets of tools and processes. However, frequently the result is that content can only be managed with hard to use and sometimes expensive tools. Text stored is stored in proprietary formats and only the technical writers can make even simple changes. Not getting the whole team involved means we lose contributions and the perspective of other team members. Developers also learn less about the customer's experience of their product. At some point, publication can become, can become slow and cumbersome, and it can be a mad scramble to get the documentation ready for each release. Docs have become the bottlenecks in many projects. Let me tell you about my journey and how I avoided this problem. I've been in IT for a number of years, working on everything from mainframes to IoT devices, and I'm the developer relations geek at Papercut Software in Melbourne. I write a lot of documentation for our developer community. When I took on responsibility for developer relations, I knew that writing tools like Madcap Flare and Microsoft Word were not going to be productive enough for me. So I took inspiration from my Unix roots and started using plain text content and developer style workflows to get content out the door. I was inspired by the 1970s technology and hadn't yet heard about docs as code. But once I started, I quickly discovered that the technical writing community had embraced the same approach, but with updated tools and processes. So now I can achieve much higher productivity using things like GitLab, static site generators, lightweight markup formats, and many other things. I can even use some of my old tools like SED and GREP and so on. Even better that the other developers in my team contribute and publish content for the project as well. I've only got 25 minutes, so I've actually created an example set of notes on a GitLab Pages website. And that website is actually maintained using docs as code approach. So hopefully it will serve as an example for you to see how this is done in a practical fashion. So here's actually a page from, that, from those sets of notes. And I've actually deliberately opened this one about the role of the tech writer for two reasons. First of all, a little bit, I'm going to demonstrate how we can make changes to this page. And secondly, it's important to remember that tech writers are still valuable members of the team. But now we can actually get them to focus on higher value activities, such as creating information architectures or maintaining our style guides. Now, this page here is actually stored inside the GitLab repository as restructured text, which is a lightweight markup language. And it's quite simple to use. It's just ordinary text. And then there are these simple adornments to give, this, give it some structure and provide other uh, entities in the document. I'll talk a bit more about this uh, in a minute. If we go back up to the top level, as well as the actual content, it's worth while drawing your attention to the GitLab YAML file that actually shows some of the automation techniques that I put in, and I'll be showing, talking about this in more detail in a minute. But you should definitely come back and have a look at this file for yourself later on. Uh, and finally, and this is quite specific to this project, um, I have all the Docker-related information um, 
I'm not going to go into this in more detail, but you can come and review this later. But I'll explain why it's like this and how it's used. So let's talk a bit more about DOCS's code. First of all, at the philosophical level. So the idea is that we've adopted software development practices and DevOps practices wholesale into the documentation process. The net result is that we can try and ensure that the whole team is contributing to our documentation and that, that documentation is useful and of value to our customers. In addition to that, we're using agile techniques to make sure that it's always current and up to date and that we, we can provide release updates in a timely manner. On an ongoing basis, of course, we're also using techniques like retros to proactively improve our processes and make sure that we can continue to stay productive across the whole writing and publishing process. And that means that we're paying attention not just to the authoring and reviewing of content on the workstation, but also publication and distribution to our customers. Keep the docs close to the code is a mantra that you'll often hear. And that's certainly valuable because we should think about docs as an integral part of our product. However, despite what you may read in some places, it can often be beneficial to keep the documentation in a separate Git repository because you're following slightly different processes. But definitely, they are started as part of the same project. So at a sort of a physical level, what does it look like? So as I mentioned previously, you're using lightweight text-based text markup formats you're not keeping your content in proprietary binary formats. So I already showed you a quick example of restructured text, which is my favorite. It's quite powerful, but, I still, but still reasonably easy to use. I suspect the most popular format uh, is uh, Markdown, uh, which is made, made popular by websites like GitLab. Uh, and it's much easier to understand. Uh, however, it is less powerful, but it's widely adopted. And that may make it a good choice, certainly for your first project. Once you've got your content into these text-based formats, then you can start using text processing tools, not just text editors, but you can use stream editors. Um, you can use file inclusion and that type of thing to process your content. And you can do all of that using developer-style workflows. So all the things that we're used to, like issues and merge requests, we can adopt and, and manage our projects with. Finally, when we deliver the content, invariably we'll use something like a static site generator a wiki is also an option, uh, but it's, these are far easier tools to deploy and use than the traditional content management system. Throughout the whole process, we're using automation to get as much done as we can without involving people. And we're using build tools for two reasons. One, to wrap all the complexity into something that's much easier to use. We can just issue single commands to do quite complex activities. And secondly, build tools when variably only only a build what we need what needs to be built and it's a lot quicker particularly during the review process there's lots of information uh, on the internet a couple of references here the search terms you need are docs as code and docs like code so let's talk a bit more about automation and general um, and that sort of comes under two headings one is that you can only generate build content at build time which obviously saves you a certain amount of writing so really productive uh, bit of content generation is, is having your diagrams created for you automatically from text descriptions. Uh, my favorite tool for this is Plant UML, but there are others available. Um, and it's certainly easier to maintain diagrams under version control if they're text than having to build them using an image manipulation tool. You can extract text from other sources like files and insert that into documentation. Uh, so for example, you can extract um, examples of um, configuration settings from the uh, product repository and insert it directly into your text. If the format should change at some point in the future, your documentation is automatically updated. You can generate textual information and insert that into your documentation. So for instance, every time your um, documentation is regenerated, you can extract the current version uh, number of your product by running it um, and extracting that just that piece of information. Again, it's not something you've got to remember to manually update. You can take it one stage further and you can do things like automated translation, use automated translation tools. You can capture user interface screenshots and HTML uh, screenshots and insert those into your documentation as well. And here's an example uh, from Plant UML. The diagram on the right uh, is dynamically created every time the documentation is republished. 
and the information in the middle column, the text information is far easier to maintain uh, and track. And you can do disk between different versions, for instance, so you know what's changed. And that's all you actually have to edit. The second thing you can do with automation tools is actually do is verification processes. So a nice simple example of that is spell checking. Uh, and a top, uh, top tip, always maintain a project word list of words that are specific to your project and add that project into your version control repository so that it travels with your project and any updates um, are automatically deployed as well. You can check links to make sure that links aren't broken in your documentation. And taking it to the next level, you can use style checking programs or grammar checkers to uh, make sure that to try and catch as many errors as possible in your system. Um, so the, the example project that I showed you earlier on has, has a, a tool called Alex in it that checks for profane or inappropriate language um, and, and will stop deployment if it detects a problem. And you can calculate document metrics if you want to, things like word counts or reading levels or that type of thing. So where does GitLab fit into all of this? So the first thing that GitLab provides is Git, of course, and it allows us to track and record changes. We can use push and pull to transmit content between platforms in a controlled manner. And when we do start pushing on, or, or pushing things to, into repositories, then we can trigger automation events, uh, for instance, in pre-commit hooks or on the GitLab CICD, CICD platform when we're doing merges. Uh, GitLab gives us issues and merge requests, and we can just adopt those in the same way we do with our other projects to coordinate across this particular project or as many projects as we want to and track all the work that's going on. So it's a line of sight from request to publication. The GitLab CI/CD automation platform allows us to create content and perform validation, so some things I was talking about earlier on. And it finally allows us to deploy our content for publication the other thing that I haven't talked about is that the CI/CD platform allows us to build container images. Uh, so basically giving our developers or our writers, I should say, easy access to a toolkit that they can use to edit and review their, their content. And once we build those container images, then we can store them in the project's container registry, uh, ready for use by any member of the team. And we can use the same image for deployment as we use for review and editing which means that when content is reviewed locally on workstations then we've got a high degree of confidence that we're going to see exactly the same thing as our customers when it's deployed into production so that's a huge time time saving i'm calling these containers standard documentation toolkits Finally, once we have generated all this content, then we can use GitLab Pages to deploy. And, and the great thing I love about GitLab Pages is that you can have it as either a private or a public uh, feature, which means that if you have a beta project, um, this is something I'm doing at the moment, if you have a beta project, then you can actually make your pages private and only expose them to your testers uh, and your beta customers. And then once it's ready for final release, you can flip the switch and make it generally available. So let's actually see some of this in action. Um, so the first thing that we need is we need to be able to provide people with a standard Docker image that they can run on their workstation and they can use for editing and reviewing. And that's just um, uh, a simple Docker uh, Docker and Docker uh, build. Um, and you can just take this and run it pretty much as is. Um, the only thing that I've done here that might be a little unusual for some people is that I've put all of the Docker build files that I need, so the Docker file, the package dependency listings, and so on in the, in the Docker build context directory. And that just kind of keeps it out of the way um, of people who are actually not really interested in that. Once we created one of these images, then we can use it on our workstation to do local work. And that's kind of where it gets a bit interesting. So let's actually do that. Um, all we have to do is install Docker Desktop, Git and make sure that the editor or reviewer has access to a text editor. And then we can give them access to this process. Now, this is pretty hard for people to type in on their own. So typically, we package these up into scripts or maybe even, even provide people with a button on a GUI so that they could do this. And it all happens magically behind the doors. But this is this is the mechanics of how, how it runs under the hood. So let's actually do this. So what I've done is that I've created um, a change request. It's actually change request number 29. And I've got to take these two bullet points uh, and 
um, combine them into a single point because there's not much point having them like this. And this is the file that I need to edit in order to do that. So let's flip over to my text editor. And I'll just uh, start my demo. And the first thing we do is create a new branch for our fix. So it's fixed, it's, it's ticket number 29. So I'm going to use 29 throughout this. And the first thing I do is open up a preview of the current content. So this is the content running on my local system because it's a static site. It doesn't actually need a web server to serve it up. If you're using other products like Hugo, for instance, then you might need to run Hugo in development server mode. Um, so the mechanics vary between different systems, but the, the principles are identical between them all. So this is my local preview environment. Um, and I've actually got to go into this page here. And if I look at my, look at the actual thing, I had to combine these two, these two bullet points, which are these two bullet points here, in fact. So let's flip back into my editor. And I happen to have got that open. I need to put my tool, I need, in order to, to regenerate this content when it changes, I need to run my toolkit. So this is just quite a long Docker command. But the thing that's interesting is right at the end is this reload feature. So I've now got this Docker container sitting there waiting for changes to happen. Um, so as soon as I come in here and make this change and save it away, it will automatically rebuild that for me without me having to do anything. And if I hit refresh on this screen there, then the change is visible and I can view it. This is exactly how it's going to look on the final website. Let me just close that down. So being a quality professional, I'm going to run a spell check before I check it in. And that's just run make spelling. I actually did, for demonstration purposes, did want to put a spelling mistake in there. So I'll just save that spelling mistake away. And we can see the spelling spelling mistake run. And it has found that spelling mistake. Now, if I was doing it properly, I'd fix this and test it again. But let's not fix this. Let's just try and check it in immediately. So I'm going to do a commit, commit. Git commit close and try and close the ticket. But my pre-commit hook is actually running all the verification steps. And there's actually three verification, and it's failed on the spelling. So it is complaining that my spelling's not up to snuff. So let me fix that spelling mistake and save it away. And I'm going to try and do the commit again. This, this commit will take longer because um, it failed on the spelling mistake, which was the first check. It's actually going to do the spelling mistake it's then going to um, check for links and it's going to check for profane language. So it's going through now checking all the links work in my project. It takes a couple of minutes. <coughs> right, so change is committed so now I can push it I'm using push options or sorry yeah push options minus o to actually create the merge request automatically for you for me um, so I'm going to just push that branch up and say create the merge request and it does that for me automatically <coughs> and here is the merge request if I open that merge request, it shows me that it's running some pipelines. So if I look at these pipelines, and in fact, it's over here, it's actually running all the verification checks because of course it's perfectly possible for somebody on the local workstation to bypass the pre-commit hooks with the minus N option, um, or even delete all the pre-commit hooks or whatever. And so we need, to, we need to run these checks when we get a push to the cloud as well. So that's gonna take a few minutes to, to, uh, to go through. Uh, now, this is actually, I've, I've implemented this quite inefficiently. Uh, if this was a production system, this would all be a single job. Uh, but I wanted to show people that you can actually have multiple jobs running in parallel. So I spit them out like that. But eventually, that should pass. And 
I can actually merge this when the pipeline succeeds and delete the source branch, which I'm going to do because once it's when it's, it merges onto main, then it will then it will also go through the same CI or a similar CI/CD process, and but this time it will publish it. So if we go back to this pipeline, see how far it's got. That's still running. Uh, obviously, the runners are a bit slow today. Um, but in a minute, we'll see that we'll see this go through. So while we're waiting for that, let's just quickly uh, go back to here. And of course, the bit I just did was the merge merge re merge request review um, and approved it. But when the pipeline approves, normally, of course, you might. Um, actually check the content out onto a local system and run exactly the same process as I did before to review the change and see what it would look like on the website. Um, and just something to say quickly here is that um, all of my team are following this process. Occasionally I'm working with, for instance, members of our legal department and training them up on this system um, for a few changes that they might do every year doesn't really work. So I'm happy for them to do their changes in Google Docs which is what they're used to, and then I manually integrate their changes in. If they were using the system every couple of weeks, then I might invest more time in training them. But it works fine, as is. And eventually, once all these tests have changed, have, have passed, and the merge has occurred, and the tests have been reapplied again, it will post to pages. And this is how you do it. This is not particularly sophisticated and was basically copied pretty much as is for the examples that GitLab already supplied to us. So let's flip back here and see how it's done. So this job succeeded. Let's go back to the pipeline. So all the jobs proceeded. So there should be a new pipeline now for the public, so, so for the actual merge. So remember that when this pipeline passed, I said I want the merge to occur automatically. That's now happened. So now it's running a second job or set of jobs that are going to go through all the checks again, because it's of course possible that in doing the merge, maybe something broke. But the thing that's different this time is we're doing the deployment to pages, um, which is, so it's just regenerating all the content now and rebuilding it for the pages environment. And we should have time, we'll actually see this published. Whilst we're waiting for that, I might just finish up quickly with our summary. So GitLab is a single source of truth for all my documentation projects. Uh, it also handles all the processes around my documentation projects. So I've got one place to get everything. Everyone on my team can contribute and does contribute with using the tools that I provide to them. And it's very easy for them. I had to, because they're developers, they just read the readme file. There was no training involved and it just worked. Um, and having local tools and review loops actually hugely shortens the, the time scale it takes to actually make a change. If I see something fairly simple wrong, I can get a new change out with uh, having done a review within a matter of a few minutes. That's really great. Automation increases my productivity and, and everybody's productivity, in fact, and reduces the number of errors that are made. The spell checking was an example of that. And with the GitLab platform, I've saved huge amounts of money on training infrastructure and tooling. So I count it as a huge success for me. This job has now succeeded. So I'm just going to flip back here and see how this publication has gone. And if we go here and refresh this, we should have seen these two. And this, this is the live website, by the way. We should see these two bullet points being combined into a single thing. Can take a couple of. Um, couple of seconds. There we go. It, the content's been deployed and updated. So that concludes uh, pretty much everything I had to say. Um, I'll be around uh, on chat if you need me, or you can reach out to me on the links that I gave at the beginning of my talk uh, for any discussion or questions. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for your time and have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.